All right, chapter five, section four, probability of disjoint and overlapping events. Okay, this lesson is basically going to hinge on these two phrases that I have here in the margin. These are very common when it comes to our everyday language, two very small words, or, or and. And when it comes to probability and how it applies within this unit, ultimately probability is about finding a likelihood. And so or statements or and statements are fundamentally going to change the realms of possibility that we're going to be analyzing. For instance, for an or statement, let me use a football analogy for betting. Okay, that's tends to be the category that many of us kind of associate with probability. We think in terms of gambling or betting. So an or statement, what an or statement will fundamentally do, and in your margins, if you want to kind of put this in your own words and stuff, what or fundamentally does is it expands. It expands the realm of possibility. Basically, it will ultimately increase probability if nothing else. For instance, for tonight's Monday night football game, if I said, um, find, let, let's make a probability so we can create odds and stuff like that, find a probability that Russell Wilson throws a touchdown pass. Okay, and odds makers would be able to do that. That would be a single event that we would analyze, him throwing a single touchdown pass. But if I said like, okay, well now I wanna place a bet that uh, Russell Wilson will either throw one touchdown pass or two touchdown passes. What's fundamentally happened is I've expanded the realm of possibility. It will increase probability because if I limit it to just him throwing a single touchdown pass, he can only throw a single touchdown pass for that bet to work, basically. He throws zero, I miss. He throws two, three, four, or more, I miss, okay? Based on that bet, I would have to have him hit exactly one touchdown pass. But if I throw in an or statement, like saying he can throw one or two touchdown passes, or maybe I throw in a couple more ors, like three or four, so on and so forth. What I'm fundamentally doing is I'm expanding the bet, okay, so that he could hit one touchdown pass and I still successfully uh, get my get my winnings. Or you could hit two and I still successfully get my winnings. But again, then anything beyond that doesn't work. Okay. And so that's fundamentally how an or statement will work. And so that is how it's going to ultimately change probabilities. It's going to increase probability at the least. It is possible that it doesn't do anything to probability, but it definitely won't minimize it. Right. So for an or statement, it can increase the likelihood of something happening. Okay because it's offering in other options, okay? It's expanding the options, right? So if we're talking about probability of you getting what you want for Christmas, for instance, all right? If you had multiple things on that list and you're just have, hoping to get one of them, that's a bunch of or statements. Maybe I'll get uh, a snowboard or maybe I'll get that gaming console or maybe I'll get uh, that nice cologne I wanted or something like that. As soon as I throw in those or statements, any one of those things makes a success as opposing to needing all of them. Okay, so it expands my realm of possibility and increases probability. And statements do the opposite. Fundamentally, and statements will limit or reduce probability. The reason why has to do with the uh, kind of the mathematical definition of an and statement, um, where a, an or statement is a union of events. Basically, it offers different kind of pockets of possibilities, thus increasing the realm of possibility. An and statement, we're looking for an intersection. So let me put that in terms of like the football betting again for tonight's Monday night football game. If I were to say, uh, I want to place a bet that Seattle Seahawks win tonight's football game against the Philadelphia Eagles. Okay. That's a single event and it's pretty cut and dry. Seattle will have to win the game. But if I threw in an and statement, like saying, I'm going to bet that Seattle wins the game and they win by three points or even at least three points or something like that. I've put a fundamental limitation on that. So not only do they have to win the game, but they have to also do it by a certain number. Fundamentally, that has limited the likelihood. It has reduced the probability, okay? 
from a betting standpoint, by expanding probability, it tends to pay out a lot less because it's more likely. Whereas more specifically, as I get into uh, those more specific and statements and stuff, it decreases likelihood, thus increases payout from a betting standpoint. Okay. Th those are just kind of the fundamental concepts right there. But those or statements and and statements fundamentally get added to a lot of different things that we find probability for, not just betting. But what we're starting to do is that we're creating multiple events. Because anytime I add an or, however many ors I add, okay, each of those or statements has another event attached to it. So for instance, with that football analogy, Russell Wilson throwing one touchdown or two touchdown passes, each of those different events has its own probability, right? And so that's going to, I need to figure out a total probability after those events. For an and statement, with Seattle winning the football game and winning it by three points, for instance, okay, each of those events has its own probability. And so, again, fundamentally, I need to find a total probability. This is a little bit of a relation back to what we did in section three, where we're analyzing multiple events and how it affects a total probability. So, within this section, we're going to look at those multiple events and the words disjoint and overlapping refer to how those events interact with each other. So at, at what I'll do before I actually get into the whiteboard examples is I'll just give like our basic definitions and stuff. Disjoint simply means that the outcomes of the shared, uh, the, the events, um, whatever events I'm analyzing, they don't share anything in common. Okay. They don't share anything in common. So there's no shared outcomes. So an illustration here within the example, we'll, we'll uh, get away from the football analogies right now. So we'll go back to something a little more familiar, hopefully, a deck of cards. Okay. So be, again, before I go into the actual solution process here, uh, just the illustration of how this is disjoint, a card is randomly selected from a standard 52 card deck. Okay. Basically, I, I fan out a bunch of cards face down in front of you. I say, pick a card, any card. Finding the probability that that card you select is either a 10 or a face card. The or statement fundamentally, fundamentally increases the likelihood because there's now more elements that it could possibly be. It does not have to be both at the same time. But selecting a 10 or a face card are disjoint events. Why? Because a 10 is not a face card. And there are no face cards that are tens. They're completely separate events, completely separate outcomes. They share nothing in common. Tens and face cards are completely different. There is no overlap. All right. What are the face cards? In case you're wondering, kings, queens, jacks. Those are your face cards. The 10 is a numerical card and it does not have anything in common with the face cards. Right. So that would be considered a pair of disjoint events. And all that simply means is that there's no overlap between the two. And so I give a formula up here. We'll, we'll come back to this again for our example about how I can calculate the total probability of either of these scenarios happening because I could either pick a 10 or a face card. So that's going to affect the total probability outcome. But we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. Before I jump into that, I want to give our second illustration here for overlapping events, the other namesake for this section. So overlapping events is just the flip side of the same coin. So now I have two events that do share some common ground. There is literally an overlap. So what would that look like? Here's our illustration right here. Again, a deck of cards. What is the probability that a card that I select is either a face card or a spade? So those are two separate things that would have their own probabilities. But the important thing to understand here is that there is some overlap between these two, unlike our previous example. Okay, Face cards, again, kings, queens, or jacks. Is it possible that some of the face cards could also be spades? Yes. Okay, There is a king of spades. There is a queen of spades and there is a jack of spades, which are also in this category, right? Of all the spades in a deck of cards, which is one of the four suits, 
hearts, diamonds are red ones, and then spades and clubs are black ones. Of, of this suit, of the 13 different spades in a deck of cards, three of those spades are face cards. So there is some overlap between the two. And because of that, I want to make sure that when I'm calculating out the probability of selecting it, I'm not counting the same possibilities more than once. And so the, the formula will fundamentally change. You'll notice that it's mostly the same as the one above, right? It still has the probability of one event and the probability of the other that I'm adding together. But then I'm subtracting out the intersection, to use a mathematical term. This represents the intersection between the two events. In other words, in this illustration, the face cards that also happen to be spades. But the reason why I'm subtracting it out is because this was already counted in one of these two categories. Okay, so for instance, probability of event A, we'll call that drawing a face card. The king of spades is part of that possibility because it is a face card. But if I, in probability B involved the spades, king of spades is also in there. It's not like there are magically two cards in this deck that are both king of spades. So what I'm doing by subtracting out this space is I'm getting rid of one of those double counted elements. And so the king of spades will be subtracted in this as well as the queen of spades, as well as the jack of spades, basically the overlapped piece. And so those are the two formulas that we're gonna be using. It's just using probability notation, but now let's get into our actual uh, whiteboard uh, worked out solutions, okay? So let's jump to whiteboard. All right, problem number one, we were told that we were selecting a card from a deck, a standard 52 card deck, all right? And so in this instance, we are given uh, a, a multiple possibility, an or statement. We can either select a 10 or we could select a face card. So we can technically break this up into two possible options, event one, or we'll call it event A, or option A, however you want to describe it, would be drawing a 10, okay? We'll call it 10. So uh, to use probability notation, we'll call it the probability of selecting a 10, right? Event B, or this option B, we can also describe it, right? Event B would be the other option here, which is the probability of selecting a face card. So we'll call that probability of a face, okay? And the face cards, again, represent kings, queens, and jacks. So I could also rewrite this as the probability of either drawing a king, queen, or jack, whichever way works best for you. Um, I'm okay with you writing it however you wish, but when it refers to face cards, this, these are the options it's talking about. And they're called face cards because literally on the playing cards themselves, they have the animated drawings of uh, a king, queen, and jack. Okay, so in each case, there's nothing really different with how I calculate out probability. It still is going to be represented by a fraction. And in this fraction, the denominator represents the total sample space. Well, if I'm drawing from a deck of cards, that sample space is 52 total cards that I'm selecting from. This will end up being a common theme through these examples we do today. The numerator is going to represent what we call favorable outcomes. In other words, the stuff that's in the parentheses. How many different ways are there, there to draw a 10 out of this deck? Well, there are four 10s in a deck of cards. There's a 10 of hearts, 10 of diamonds. There's a 10 of, heart, uh, sorry, 10 of spades and a 10 of clubs. So there are four 10s out of 52 possible cards. So my probability of selecting a 10 is four over 52. You'll, you'll recognize this. This is the same exact probability as me selecting an ace. Okay, that, that was an illustration we did in section one. Now, technically this can reduce, but what I'm gonna suggest here is when I'm finding a total probability of multiple options of or statements or and statements, wait to reduce until after you've done your calculation. You'll see what I mean in a second. All right, so this is my probability, my raw probability, not my like reduced probability. This would reduce to one over 13, but this is my raw probability of me selecting a 10. So let me move over here to my other option, selecting a face card. Again, fundamentally, 
I'm going to end up with a fraction. The denominator is the total sample space. It's still the standard 52 deck of cards. So 52 options to select from. But now when I'm calculating out the probability of my favorable outcomes, the sample space here, there are four kings, four queens, and four jacks. So I would add up those options, four kings, four queens, and four jacks. Giving me a total space here for favorable outcomes of four plus four plus four, or 12 out of 52. Okay, and this guy was four out of 52. Okay, each of these probabilities, okay, in this case, this was me selecting a 10, event A, and this one was selecting a face card, event B. Now, again, back to what the question was asking for, it's the probability of either of these things happening. If either of these things happen, then I have a success, right? And so in order to find the probability of this, our formula, so to speak, let me send this properly, there we go. Our formula for this told us that the probability of what we call disjoint events, these are disjoint again, because they share nothing in common. There are no tens that are also face cards. There are no face cards that also happen to be tens. My probability calculation is pretty simple. I just add up the probability of event A with the probability of event B. Now, there's a reason why I didn't bother reducing these, and both these fractions reduce. It's because ultimately when I have to add them together, anytime I add fractions, I need common denominators. Might as well use one where I have already a common denominator set up. right? I can reduce it at the very end. So for this example, when I simply add them together, probability of event A, which was selecting a 10, was 4 over 52. Four tens out of 52 total cards. And then I'm going to add the probability of event B. Event B, again, was selecting a face card. There were 12 face cards out of 52 possible. The 12 coming from the four kings, four queens, and four jacks. So that when I add these together, I get 16 out of 52. Hopefully you remember that when you add fractions, you simply, once you have the common denominator, which is why I kept it that way, I simply add my two numerators together and it's over the same denominator. So this would be my final probability. I would just check to see if it reduces. This one does reduce. Four goes into both the numerator and denominator and I would be left with four thirteenths. This would be my final probability. And this actually makes sense, just as a little sanity check here. The reason it's 4 over 13, 13 represents how many cards are in each suit, both uh, with hearts, diamonds, spades, and uh, clubs, 13 cards in each suit. The 4 represents the king, queen, jack, and 10, because none of them overlapped. It's just four of those possible 13 different cards. And then it would be for each suit. So that's the probability of our first example. All right, let's move on. Let's do now overlapping events and see what changes there. <clears throat> so it'll start with the kind of same question. We're trying to find a probability. We're still dealing with um, a deck of cards. Let me clean this up a little bit. There we go. All right, so we still have two events, but in example number two, just to quickly show you our notes here. Example number two, here we're given, what is the probability that a card selected is a face card or a spade? These end up being overlapping events because there are spades that are face cards and there are face cards that are spades. But in either case, let's go through the probability. So event A, we'll call this the probability of drawing a face card. All right. Again, that will have its own unique probability. This will actually be the same exact thing that we just did in the last example. Event B now is going to be the probability of selecting a spade, a spade being one of the four suits in a deck of cards. Okay, But in either case, I'm going to be calculating out a fraction. The denominator in both cases is still the 52 total cards in the deck. The numerators okay, over here... Uh, for the face card, just to show the work again, there are still 
four kings, there are still four queens, and there are still four jacks. Okay, so there are a total of 12 face cards. So that part is the exact same as our um, as our first example. And so event A in this case, and it really doesn't matter which one you make, A or B or anything like that. Just They represent the two different possibilities we're combining together here because either a face card or a spade is possible here. Right, so there are 12 out of the 52 cards that are, that are face cards. For spades, this one, uh, there are four different equally, uh, equally uh, distributed uh, suits in a deck of cards. And so if you wanna know how many are in each suit, you would simply take the 52 and divide by four. You would find that there are 13 of each suit. Specifically here, I'm gonna care about spades. There are 13 different spades in a deck of cards. Okay, ace of spades, two of spades, three of spades through 10, then a jack, queen, and a king. There are 13 total spades in a deck of cards. Again, that would simply be found by taking this number and dividing it by four, one for each of the four suits. Okay, so here, this one didn't take any other combination. My, my probability simply here is 13 out of 52. This can be reduced that would be reduced to one out of four, representing the four different suits. But again, my suggestion here is don't reduce until the very end. But these represent my two possibilities, okay? Me selecting a face card, me selecting a spade. But here's where we're gonna run into a little bit of a problem. Parts of these uh, two events, so to speak, overlap. In other words, some of the face cards are also spades that are counted into these numbers. Some of the spades are also face cards. We need to figure out how many. Okay, so let me scroll down to there. Okay, so that's still face cards, that's still uh, spades. So now what I wanna figure out is the probability of both A and B happening at the same time. In other words, A represented a face card B represented a spade. So I wanna find out how many possibilities were there both at the same time. How many face cards are also spades? How many spades are also face cards? And so in this case, this has its own set of probability. There are still 52 total cards in a deck of cards, okay? But I wanna find out how many are both face and spade at the same time. Okay, I wrote an A and B, but in this case, A was face cards, B was spades. And so writing them out, I have a king of spade plus a queen of spade plus a jack of spade. And that's it. There are three cards that are both at the same time. Okay, king, queen, and jack are the only face cards, right? And then the spade part, I wouldn't care about like a jack of hearts, for instance, because the jack of hearts would not be a spade, right? So in this case, this will tend to be a very small sample space. And, and what I find here is that this would become three possibilities out of 52 cards are the overlap. In other words, three of those 12 face cards happen to be spades three of those 13 spades happen to be face cards. They're counted in both of these individually. So how do I calculate out the probability? Okay, um, let me just scroll all the way down here. Okay, so here is the formula for calculating out our probability with overlapping events. Okay, we have the or statement, okay? either a face card or a spade. And that's going to start very similarly. Probability of a face card plus the probability of a spade. But now I need to subtract out the piece that is overlapped, the piece that's counted twice. And that is gonna be my P, my no, not my P, P of A and B happening at the same time. Technically, I could use the same formula with that first example. This just would happen to be zero. Because if you recall for the first example, when it was tens and face cards, there were no cards in common. And so this just would happen to be zero. 
But here is my formula that I need to use for overlapping events. And so I literally just am plugging these values in. So probability of A was the probability of a face card. There are 12 out of the 52 cards that are face cards. I need to add the probability of event B. Event B was spades. There are 13 spades out of the 52 total cards. But now I need to subtract out the part that's shared or in common or overlapped. And we just found that out to be that there are three cards out of the 52 total cards that are in both of these categories. And had I not subtracted this out, I would have counted them twice because a king of spades is in here, but it's also in here. And there are not two kings of spades in a deck of cards. So there's just some simple math that's done at this point. Again, I didn't bother reducing. All three of these could be reduced, but I'll wait until the very end to do so. 12 plus 13 would give me 25 over 52, but I need to make sure I subtract out the three that were shared or in common or overlapped. And that would give me 22 over 52 as my probability. This can reduce now, okay? And so two goes into both of these and it would become 11 over 26 would be my final probability. And it's useful waiting till the very, very end to do that piece because had I not done that now, um, had I reduced along the way, I would have to find the common denominators. It becomes very, very complicated at that point. But that's how I would find the probability of overlapping events. All right, I'm gonna briefly talk through the last example. It's going to be another one of these overlapping event ones, but it's just presented in a different way. So I wanted to kind of just talk through the example and I'll direct you at that point to the uh, solution sheet that is also uploaded onto Google Classroom. But here is our last example. Okay, it's a little bit longer word problem because they're giving us a lot of information at first. So in this case, they're telling us out of 200 students in the senior class, so this is representing a school that's a little bit bigger than Big Bear, but not by much. Out of, a, out of 200 students in the senior class, 113 are either a varsity athlete or on the honor roll, okay? There are 74 senior varsity athletes out of the 200, and there are 51 seniors out of the 200 that are on the honor roll, okay? So there's a lot of information in those first couple sentences. What is the probability that a randomly selected senior is both a varsity athlete and on the honor roll, okay? So this is a representative of the and statement of two different events. The event, the events here would be event A, for instance, being on, on the varsity team and event B being on the honor roll. Okay, so I'm just going to talk through this briefly just to close out this lesson. Essentially, what I'm going to use here is this formula. And actually, they've given me little bits and pieces of in here. For instance, okay. Well, I'm going to be filling in what I know and solving for what I don't. And spoiler alert here is I'm going to be solving for this piece, the and statement. So let's take this piece by piece. 200 students. That's the very first piece they tell me. This will end up being the denominator for each of these probabilities. This represents the sample space. Okay, that in, in, the, amount, in the information that they gave me, this represents the total sample space of 200 total students that I'm going to be analyzing, 200 total seniors specifically. Okay. The next piece they tell me is that there are 113 of those 200 that are either varsity or, keyword or, on the honor roll. That represents this piece right here. The probability of event A, call it varsity, or event B, call that one honor roll, in this case would be 113 over 200. So my fraction that I could replace with this or statement here would be 113 over 200. The next piece they tell me is that there are 74 senior varsity athletes. We'll call that event A. Call event A being on the varsity team. Well, 74 out of the 200 are right there. They tell me then that there are 51 seniors out of the on the honor roll. So the 51 out of 200 would represent uh, event B. And so 74 over 200 plus 51 over 200, you'd find that to become 125 out of 200 does not equal the 113 out of 200. Your basic job there is to find the difference between the 125 and the 113, and that will represent the overlap. And what you would find is that 12 students are both varsity athletes 
and honor roll students. So you would use this formula. You're just replacing the pieces of information where they would go, right? You just have to designate what's A and B. A, call that varsity athlete. B, call that honor roll. All right, but that solution can be found on the solution sheet that is uploaded to Google Classroom. But I'll go ahead and end there and stop recording.